how can the Enneagram be helpful in relationship with ourselves? Let's just kind of do a little intro work, kind of back up and back into that. And we'll do a little, you know, scripture. We're in a church, right? So, so before we get too nervous about who Clay is invited to uh, talk on a, on a Wednesday night in, in the church house, we'll, do, we'll go to the Bible. That's a good sp- st- place to start. You know, the Enneagram is not the gospel. It's not the Bible. So I don't ever want anybody to be nervous thinking that, you know, this is something that's the end all be all. This is a tool. It's a really beautiful, wonderful, helpful tool that can lead us toward healthy relationships with ourselves, with others, and with God, but it's just one tool. So I hope over these three weeks that if you're not already a a, a person who kind of is interested in the Enneagram, I hope it will resonate with you, and if it doesn't resonate with you, leave it behind and just find another tool. But I think we all need tools. Thomas Merton says, any Thomas Merton fans? Um, one of our, he's, he's a little bit of kind of a local, right? You know, he lived so much of his life in Kentucky, so we kind of claim him in Tennessee too. But Thomas Merton, who was a Trappist monk, said that the beginning of love is letting the people we love be perfectly themselves and not requiring them to fit our image inside of them. You see, what happens is so often We love our own image that we see in the people that we love, right? And we kind of think, how in the world can you not get this like I get this? How can you not process things the way that I process things? Anybody that had a sibling knows that you've had an experience of like, how could we have been raised by the same parents in the same house? We went to the same schools. We played the same sports. And yet we just see the world so differently. And the Enneagram just gives us some language for how, why that is. Because we all carry a different wound. We all carry different motivations. We all carry different desires and longings. And those impact the choices that we make all through our lives. So, going to the scriptures. Matthew 22 is the beautiful passage, right, that tells us what are the great laws, what are the great things, Jesus, that we're supposed to do. And of course, we learn, love God and love your neighbor as yourself, right? And and that's a lifetime of work to try to do a little bit of some of that, right? That's kind of our lifetime work as Christians. Love God, love our neighbor as ourselves. Um, What I love about that whole kind of beautiful command is that I think it reveals to us that if we don't have a healthy relationship with ourselves. We're not going to have a healthy relationship with our neighbors. And then if we don't have a healthy relationship with our neighbors, we learn in 1 John 4, 20, how are you going to love your neighbor who's in front of, how are you not going to, if you don't love your neighbor in front of you, how are you going to love God who you can't see, right? If, if you say you love God, but you don't love your neighbor, what does that mean? That's what 1 John 4, 20 tells us. So I think we take some of those just ideas and beautiful words in scripture and we just kind of know intuitively as humans that we've got to have a healthy relationship with just me, myself, and I if we're going to have healthy relationships with other people if we're going to have a healthy relationship with God. Sometimes if you're like me and you grew up in, you know, just steeped in church stuff and and just kind of southern evangelical culture, you kind of maybe heard some of the opposite of like, you got to really white knuckle your way to loving God. And then if you love God really well, you know, that's going to help you be a good person and help you be happy. But I think we're invited to just reflect on the ways in which we think about our own personhood. Let that inform the ways we think about our self in relationship, which all ultimately heads us in the direction to loving God, the one who has made us in some mysterious way in his image. And so the Enneagram is a pathway to discovering How can I have some greater compassion for myself? How can I find a healthy pathway for me to live in that that, that really sets me up to have a deeper sense of healthy relationship with myself, others, and God? Okay, so you with me? Okay. It's fun to be here. So I I always, you know, 
I said this last time, but you know, I, I'm, I'm kind of y'all's country cousin out there in Brentwood pastoring at Christ Church. And you know, it's kind of a, a Pentecostal church, so it's kind of rowdy. And so I'm not afraid of speaking out of turn or raised hands or anything. Um, but I, I told y'all last, you know, I grew up with Dr. Sherman. Anybody remember Dr. Sherman across the street? And so Dr. Sherman was my childhood pastor and he's like the Energizer Bunny. He's still going. He's still pastoring. He's doing good. He's, he'll bury us all. Um, so the Enneagram ultimately is not principally about behavior. That's one of the things that kind of distinguishes it from some of the other personality tools. And I know we've got a lot of folks in the room with a lot of different histories and relationships with Enneagram. So let me just say, this is a personality tool, right? Kind of a la the other ones, you know, Myers-Briggs and DISC and Strength Finder and are you an otter, tiger, lion, bear? You know, all, all, the, all the good, and, and they're all got something good to teach us. And they're all helpful in some way. But the Enneagram has some distinguishing factors. Principally, it's almost always taught with a companion faith tradition. And I think that's one of its strengths because the Enneagram reminds us that we are not just personality. We also have a soul. And so the goal with the Enneagram is to label and name our personality so that we know when we are healthy and we know when we're unhealthy. So think about for just a moment coming into a house, kind of our, our general picture of what maybe a, a Norman Rockwell painting of a house would be. You know, you come onto a front porch if you're going to a house for the first time. And if you get from the front porch into the front door, you maybe come into a living room. And in our houses, our front porches and our living rooms, they're kind of the rooms and the spaces that are kind of ready for guests, right? They're ready for strangers. They're ready for visitors. We might have a Jehovah's Witness knock on the door. They, we got to be kind of ready for somebody just to walk in. And so we've kind of thought about what they look like. They reflect us in some way. They, they reflect kind of who we are a little bit. And we've, we've curated them maybe. And we've decorated them in ways that reflect our, our own just values and our own histories. But beyond our front porches and our living rooms, we've got other rooms in the house. We've got kitchens and bedrooms and dens and back porches and backyards. And we all know that the really good stuff happens back there, right? The, the people who are closest to us, who are the most intimate, who see the most deeply who we are, those conversations are happening in, around kitchen tables and in bedrooms and in dens. Our personalities are our front porches and living rooms. They're just the first thing that everybody meets. And, and they are... They help us. They're good. You know, it's when we just go into Kroger, when we go to the mall and we just are interacting with somebody, they learn a little bit about our personality. They learn, you know, oh, he's, he's kind of quiet and she's real outgoing or uh, he's funny. You know, she always has a joke for everything. You know, just whatever the, the front porch living room things are about ourselves. But we have deeper stuff to ourselves. We have truer places inside of us that go beyond personality, right? We, we as Christians believe we have a soul, which is a great mystery. <laughs> what exactly is that, right? We believe as Christians there's this kind of mysterious, gracious Christ in you and Christ in me that sometimes we get a glimpse of, kind of like a wild animal in the woods. We just every once in a while are able to glimpse that that Christ in you and Christ in me and have that kind of interaction rather than just a personality to personality interaction. So when we use a tool like the Enneagram, we're not just trying to kind of obsess about personality. We're trying to say, let's give some language to nine different front porches and living rooms so that we can start to recognize when those personalities are too big or too small or just kind of get, get unhealthy in some way. And so that with language and with recognition, we can kind of pivot and we can adjust and we can, we can choose to respond in ways that are healthier for our personalities so that we don't lose touch 
with the deeper, truer stuff. Because people love you for your personality. If you're funny and outgoing, people expect you to be funny and outgoing. If you're helpful, people expect you to be helpful. And so the world kind of feeds our personality and makes it bigger and bigger. And this tool can help us just recognize when they get too big and maybe are blocking our pathway toward our souls and our truer sense of self. The origins of the Enneagram, somebody was asking me about that in a minute, are kind of mysterious. And so if you're a person who, who you know, loves, and I, I'm one of these people, loves scientific studies and research, the Enneagram is kind of going to confound you a little bit because it is in the wisdom tradition of stuff. It's not, it's not a, a scientific diagnostic tool. It's more a wisdom tradition that's been passed on from the centuries and has grown and morphed and adapted. Thousands of years ago, people were using an early version of the Enneagram principally related around the seven deadly sins and how each Enneagram type kind of gravitates toward one of those sins. So what I want to do as we get going today in talking about how the Enneagram can lead us to have healthier relationships with ourselves is I want to describe to you the nine Enneagram wounds, which will give you a little context about what each type deals with and, and what makes up each type. And then I want to pivot and talk a little bit about Thinking, feeling, doing, and past, present, and future. That's where we're going to land tonight. We're going to talk about how knowing your Enneagram type can help you find better balance in thinking, feeling, and doing, and integrating your past, your present, and your future. So I know that sounds maybe a little woo-woo at the moment, but we'll get there. Are y'all still with me? Okay, good, good. Um, it's fun to see familiar faces in the room. I'm looking back here and seeing Dominic Smith from, you know, French class with, you know, at, at MBA. Good to see you, man. Um, so the nine Enneagram wounds describe ways in which we are just triggered from childhood to just carry some kind of woundedness. And so we all kind of know that from our earliest days, we have just experienced a wound, and that's kind of weird language and, and not always that fun to talk about. Um, but we carry wounds from childhood and those wounds influence the decisions that we make, the choices that we make, the way that we are in relationship. These wounds come from a mysterious mixture of just nature and nurture, right? I mean, like everything. Everything in kind of the, the psychological, sociological community sort of tells us that we have to hold with open hands this mystery of we come into the world with some wiring and also our early experiences just kind of inform how that wiring uh, just morphs and changes and adapts. And so most Enneagram teachers say that these wounds are pretty settled by about the age of five. And so we've carried these. And so I'm going to go through all nine, but I'm, I usually, when I do this, I start with ones and I, you know, makes sense, right? Start with ones and then run through and end with nines. And a couple of weeks ago, I was hosting a seminar on the Enneagram and parenting and two nines came up to me at the end and they said, you're always running out of time at the end and nines are always last and we're always worried that our presence doesn't matter anyways. And so I'm kind of trying to do better and not always start with ones and end with nines. So I'm going to start, I'm going to start with someone's just favorite Enneagram number. Tell me where to start. Somebody yell out a number. Seven. seven. I love it. I'm going to start with sevens tonight. So sevens, you guys, sevens are a number. Are you a seven? Oh, oh, nice. Okay. <laughs> Sevens are fun, though. Yeah. Sevens are a number on the Enneagram that is, is a number that loves adventure and spontaneity. And sevens kind of every day is like a snow day for sevens. You know, they want things to be fun. They want things to kind of be a little, you know, not always so heavy. They want us to not take ourselves too seriously. They don't want to be tied down. They definitely don't want to be trapped in pain. You know, they, they want to kind of 
reframe things that are sad and painful into things that can be fine and light and funny. And they, they are buoyant. They lift us up. Um, they remind us to not all take ourselves so seriously. And so sevens are just a good, fun, passionate, energetic, up for the adventure number on the Enneagram. But what's going on behind the surface is sevens carry a wound. And here's the wound that sevens carry. You better not depend on anybody for anything. So can we just stop there and say, here's what can be so beautiful about a tool like this. On the surface, you're meeting someone who you love or live with or work with that is one of those fun, every day's a snow day kind of person. And they're trying to lift our spirits and they're up for adventure and they want to be spontaneous. And they seem like they're always up. But there's a wound that is inside that's informing everything they do. And that wound says, you know what? At the end of the day, I might just be alone in the universe and I better not depend on anybody for anything. If I'm going to have fun, if I'm going to make my way, it's up to me and I better go do it myself. And so sevens carry that wound. And that's just a compassion point because we, we, we aren't very good to sevens. Here's why we're not very good to sevens. Do I have any sevens in the room? When sevens do their work, meaning when sevens get healthy, the rest of us say, what happened to you? You're no fun anymore. We used to always be able to count on you to kind of be up. And so this tool can just help us give a little bit more space for people who are trying on some new ways of being. And, and, and not just, you know, what if we just didn't drag everybody back into their old patterns of being? What if when somebody we loved is trying something new on and is kind of trying a new way of living and making their way through the world and we didn't say, what's wrong with you? We want the old you back. Haven't we all heard that in some way at some moment? So that's the wound that sevens carry. Eights carry a wound. Eights are our number that is strong and passionate. And eights have good boundaries. Eights are charging forward towards goals. Eights are concerned with justice. They want things to be right. They want things to be fair. They want things to be just. Um, they don't want anybody to control them. They want to make sure that they can stand on their own two feet and nobody's controlling them. Eights are a little bit aggressive and can be a little bit intimidating to numbers that aren't eights. But the wound that's going on behind the surface with eights is that from early childhood, eights have felt like everybody in their life is capable of betraying them. And that they better be sure to not trust people too quickly. Because if they're a little too vulnerable, or if they give a little too much of themselves away, somebody might not turn out to be trustworthy, somebody might betray them, and they better just kind of manage their world to make sure that can't happen. So do you see the compassion point of people in our lives that are strong and passionate and are tough? that there's this wound there that's influencing their behavior that says, you might be betrayed, so you better be strong. Anybody remember the X-Files? The slogan, trust no one. Eights kind of live by that. And eights may trust five to ten people in a lifetime. And it takes one time to get off their list. And I'll just tell you, let me just park at eights for a second to tell you how valuable this tool can be in relationships. I'm a two. I'm going to get there in a moment and tell you what twos are. But let me tell you something about eights that you got to know. Who are my eights? Eights need all the news. They need the good, the bad, and the ugly. If you hide news from them, if you kind of sugarcoat it, if you kind of tap dance around the news you all of a sudden have become an untrustworthy person. So if you've got something to tell an eight, or if you've got news that's relevant to them, you just need to go on and tell it. And they can handle it. They're strong. They can deal with it. 
But twos, and we'll get there in a moment, just, just a little sneak peek, twos absolutely don't need all the news. Like, whatever you do, please do everything you can to keep bad news from me. And, and if, you've got, if you've got something that you've got to tell me, if it's just really important and it must be told, then I kind of need you to wrap that news up in a nice package. And if you have another package, you could actually wrap that package in another package and kind of walk me toward the news. Well, if we don't have some tool, we just don't have language to, to understand why it's actually not going to be that helpful to just hit me with the news straight on. And it's going to not be very helpful to just tap dance with clay around trying to kind of keep the news from him and not quite share it and kind of back your way into it. So we've got to learn how to love people and live with people in relationship in the way that they can receive love and in the way that they can, can, can live with us in healthy ways. So that's the wound that eights carry. Nines carry a wound. See, I didn't get to y'all last, nines. Nines carry a wound that says, you probably better not assert yourself. Like, like it would be better if you could just sort of minimize your presence, not take up too much space. It'd be so great if you could kind of go along and get along with everybody else and with all that's already going on and just not take up too much space in the universe. So nines kind of live in response to that wound in a way of kind of minimizing their presence a lot of times in, in work, in church, sometimes in family, sometimes in marriage, kind of just limiting their engagement a little bit and not putting themselves out there too quickly or too deeply. And so it's, it's a lifetime of spiritual work for nines. We'll get here on week three, but it's a lifetime of spiritual work for nines to kind of rise up and take your place in the universe and realize that the things that are yours to get to are valuable and are worthy of getting to. Because nines hear a wound that says, don't assert yourself too much. I'm not quite sure your presence matters all that much in this room, in this family, in this community. And that's a wound. You can see how that would just influence a lifetime of choices. Ones carry a wound that says, you really ought to try to be perfect. And it would be great if you just didn't make any mistakes. And furthermore, if you're going to find love and belonging, which sidebar, I kind of think that's what we're all looking for in life, right? We're looking for love and we're looking for belonging. That's what we do in our, in our faith systems. That's what we do in our communities and our families. If you're going to find love and belonging as a one, you probably believe that you're only going to find it if you live your life according to a rigid set of guidelines and patterns established by the powers that be. And who are the powers that be? Nobody ever knows, but they're just out there determining things for us. But so ones, ones live in a way that says, I really, I really should, should try my hardest to be perfect and to not make mistakes and to live my life in the way that we've all agreed to live our lives and to do things the right way, not the wrong way, because there is a right way and there is a wrong way. And so ones have spent their lifetimes working on perfecting themselves and perfecting things and perfecting families and perfecting communities. And they do things really well. And they do things with excellence. But it's a burden to carry that sense of it's, it's yours to, you know, uphold the standard of righteousness. That's a burden that ones carry. And it's part of their wound. Twos carry a wound that says... It's, it's very similar to the nine's wound, but I'll distinguish. The two's wound is, there are so many people out here that have so many needs. So, it'd be great if you didn't have many needs. And like, it'd be so great if you could kind of just help everybody else with their needs 
and you could just be real attentive and real helpful and real giving and kind of, you know, not, not assert your own needs all that much, that'd be so great. So twos have spent their lifetime minimizing their own needs, minimizing their own feelings and desires and goals and dreams, and by going after the rest of us and, and, and helping us and giving to us and fixing us and rescuing us and saving us. You know, I always say, I'm a two. I say, if God didn't mean for me to create enmeshed codependent relationships, why did he give me all the tools that are necessary? <laughs> and twos have all the tools that are necessary for kind of creating these enmeshed relationships where, where I become your, your hero or I become your fixer or I just over-involve myself in your life. It's a similar wound to the nine. You know, both twos and nines here, we kind of need you to minimize your own stuff and kind of, you know, go with the stuff that other people have got going on. But here's the difference. Nines hear that and they turn inward and withdraw. And twos hear that and they turn outward and go, go after you and go help you and go intervene. And that's the wound that twos carry. Threes carry a wound that says, if you're going to find love and belonging, it's going to be because you were able to be whatever we needed you to be and shift your identity and shift your behavior. And you were able to be successful at everything you do. So threes are trying to wow us with their accomplishments. And here's the thing, threes are able to change and morph and adapt to be whatever they need to be to be successful. So, people kind of caricature threes sometimes because America is a three country and Nashville is thought to be a three city and I'm going to tell you what, 37215 is a three zip code. You know, so, so people sometimes kind of get this caricature of, you know, a three is, you know, driving a Land Rover and their kids go to Innsworth and they live in Belmead. And here's the thing. That's true. If a three lives in that context, they're going to do what it is to be successful, what it is to kind of be accomplished in that context. But if a three lived in another area of town and was the executive director of the Hunger Housing Coalition, you better believe the way to be successful at that is not to drive a Land Rover, not to have your kids go to Innsworth, and not to live in Belmead, right? You know, so, but here's the interesting thing about threes. The same human being as a three could live both of those lives and live each of those lives with integrity and with purpose and with a sense of being true to themselves because threes are that adaptable. They are really, really adaptable. But the, the, the reason the wound is because they don't think that they should have their own identity. They don't think you, that their own identity matters. They think you love them because they fit the identity that you wanted them to fit. And fours have a wound that says this. Who are my fours? I know Matt's, Matt's one of my fours. He's somewhere in the room. I talked to him earlier. Um, fours have a wound that says... The world doesn't have enough room for all of your complex, diverse feelings. Your feelings are like a little too much for us. And and we would just love it if you would kind of just turn those feelings down a little bit. They're a lot. And fours just hear that from an early age. So they, they, they come up in the world thinking... Nobody has enough room for my feelings and my feelings are complex and they're diverse and they change all the time. And so I always feel misunderstood. I always feel like nobody has enough space for me. I always feel like nobody really wants everything that I have to bring to the table. And so fours express that through through kind of longing and through private artistic expression and through feeling kind of unique and offbeat. 
And it's not that they feel more special than the rest of us. My friend Kara, who's a four, told me a couple months ago, I don't feel special. I don't even feel unique. I feel like I'm doing unique wrong. (laughs) You know, like I feel like I'm weird. That's sometimes how fours feel. And it's because the feelings that the rest of us have in the course of two weeks. You know, if you think about your last two weeks, you had a day where you were sad and you had a moment where you were just filled up with joy and you had a night where you were lonely. You know, you just had this whole spectrum of feeling over a two week period. Fours have that spectrum of feeling over a 20 minute period. It's complex, it's dynamic, it changes all the time. And that's a wound that they carry that the rest of us don't really have enough space for that, they feel. Fives, they carry a wound that says, you really shouldn't be too comfortable in the world. You really shouldn't be too comfortable in the world because the universe is not abundant. Resources are scarce. And you better kind of keep to yourself the few resources that you have. Like you better kind of hoard them, not give them away too much. You better sort of manage them because there may not be more where that came from. And so fives feel a little uncomfortable in the world and they feel like they don't quite have enough and they feel like they've got limited energy and they feel like they've got limited time. And every handshake, every hug, every, I just knocked on your office door to say hello. All of that takes something from the five. And so they intuitively learn to manage their day to have enough to get home to their loved ones before they kind of run out of energy and run out of all the stuff. And so fives are private and they're independent and they Um, don't share all that much with us personally. They are not the most affectionate of all the numbers. Doesn't mean they don't love as deeply. They just don't express as much affection. All those things that we see on the kind of outside surface level of fives, what's going on inside is that wounding message that don't be too comfortable. You better kind of keep what you have. Don't give too much away. You know, hoard a little bit of what you got. And then finally, sixes. We've almost reached the end of the the trail on our little wheel around. Um, Sixes. Sixes carry a wound that's got two parts. Who are my sixes in the room? Awesome. Sixes carry a wound that says this, part one. The world is full of danger. The world is dangerous, you guys. And sixes just know it. They knew it before we knew it. They know What could go wrong? They come into a room like this, they know where the exits are. If they've dropped their kids off in in the children's ministry, they know what policies and protocols this church has in place to make sure the right people are working with the children's ministry. I mean, they know the world is dangerous. But here's the double whammy. Here's the second part of their wound. They're not quite sure if they should trust themselves to navigate the dangers of the world safely. So the world's dangerous, but they're not so sure they should really trust themselves, which means that sixes are looking for people and communities and churches and institutions and ideals and countries and leaders who they think are stronger or more knowledgeable than they are and are looking at those systems or people to kind of discover what's right for me to navigate this dangerous world. And so, of course, you can see that the lifetime of work for a six is learning to trust yourself, learning to rely on your own inner knower, knowing that you've got everything inside yourself you need to know what's good for you and right for you and safe for you. So those are the nine wounds. And even though, you know, it's, it's not the most jazzy thing on a Wednesday night to talk about, you know, our childhood wounds. Who knew you were signing up for childhood wounds? <laughs> I apologize. We'll get A.J. Levine back. Um, also, isn't she amazing? Oh, my gosh. I, I'm in, I get on these little obsessive kicks. And so, um, you know, the Chautauqua Institution has every lecture, like, ever on their 
free on their website, and AJ's got like 30, and so I'm just going through them all these days. Um, So these are the wounds that we carry from childhood, and they influence us. They impact us. And so as humans and as Christians, if we're able to identify our Enneagram type and get in touch with our woundedness, if I'm able as a two to get in touch with the fact that I really from a young age felt like I wasn't quite sure that I should kind of tell everybody what I needed or what I felt. I felt like I should kind of be helpful. If I can get in touch with that, then these wounds can become sacred wounds. They can become wounds that actually move us toward health and healing and wholeness. Wounds that don't get us stuck. But we've got to have some language. We've got to have something that just kind of tells us that and gives us some language to hang our hat on and to investigate and to turn over to to figure out how can we go toward health and healing. Several months ago, I was preaching in my church and, and we preached through the lectionary and this passage in Romans 5 came up to preach on. And it's kind of one of those greatest hits of the New Testament passages where it says, suffering produces endurance and endurance produces character and character produces hope. It's kind of like this beautiful poetic language. And I was trying to figure out what in the world do I say about this passage because It sounded kind of like it was just this natural thing, like suffering produces endurance, which produces character, which produces hope. What am I, am I supposed to do anything? And what I discovered is, yeah, there's one thing for me to do, not avoid the suffering. If I will not avoid the suffering and let suffering, let woundedness have its journey in me and, and become a sacred woundedness, then the Holy Spirit will lead me naturally toward endurance and character and hope. And so what I want to kind of say in this back half of the evening tonight is I want to talk about how we can use our Enneagram wisdom and our Enneagram type to bring our lives into better balance. Because here's the thing, if we can be more balanced And I'll explain what I mean by that. We can have a healthier relationship with ourself, which will lead to healthier relationships with others and with God. So here's what I mean by balance. There's a psychologist in the in the world called named Maurice Nicole. This is not Enneagram talk now, this is psychology talk. Maurice Nicole says that we are made up of thinking, feeling, and doing. Okay? You know, everything that kind of makes up our day is either a thought, a feeling, or an action. Thinking, feeling, doing is what makes up our days. But the Enneagram comes in and says, based on our Enneagram type, one of those leads the dance, and one of those kind of gets left home. So there's one of thinking, feeling, and doing that we kind of lead with, that we return to most often, but there's one that kind of gets left out that we never get to. And the Enneagram comes in to say, that's that's hurting us. That's getting us into trouble. That's getting us stuck. And if we know what is repressed, what kind of gets left out of thinking, feeling, and doing, and we learn to bring it into balance, then we can have healthier, more balanced lives. Are y'all with me still? So let me kind of explain how this works. Just you know, my own little personal way that it works for me. As a two, I'm a feeler. I lead with feeling. I make decisions based on feeling. I feel things deeply. That's just my intuitive way of being in the world. It's not good. It's not bad. It just is. But as a two, I leave thinking out a lot. Now, I think all the time, but what I'm thinking about is I'm thinking about relationships and I'm thinking about feelings and I leave productive thinking out. So here's an example. Last Friday, I live really close to here, you know, just just kind of right uh, toward White Bridge Road in Harding. I live over there, but I work in Brentwood. And so I was rushed out the door last Friday and I knew that I got to get to work, but then after work, I've got to get 
to Franklin later in the evening for a dinner that I've got to be real dressed up for. So I'm walking out the door and I'm kind of running late and I'm thinking about all the things I got to do and I'm just kind of in a feeling space. And I think to myself, you know what? I don't really want to take the 90 seconds that it would take to go get extra clothes for my closet of what I'm going to need tonight. I'll just come home after work and then go back to Franklin. (laughs) And of course, you know, 440 was closed all weekend, right? Everybody discovered that. And, and so, so I'm walking out the door, but because I just kind of try my best to think Enneagram sometimes, and I'm successful 10% of the time, um, I stop myself and I say, Hunter, bring up thinking for just a minute. Think about this. You're going to drive to Brentwood, and then at 5 o'clock you're going to drive back to Belmead, and then you're going to be in Franklin by 6.15, What? That's just a little silly example of how, based on our Enneagram type, there's just something that we leave out. And so let me just talk tonight about what we leave out. Um, So we'll, we'll get focused other times on what we lead with. But what we leave out is this. For ones and twos and sixes, ones and twos and sixes, raise your hands. Ones and twos and sixes, leave out thinking. You leave out productive thinking. Now you're thinking all the time, but you're thinking about relationships. You're thinking about worst case scenario plans, and you're thinking about how you can do things better. You're not always bringing productive thinking to the table. Fours and fives and nines, you leave out doing. And again, you're busy. You're not lazy. You're doing all the time, but the problem is you're doing things that sometimes don't need to be done and you're procrastinating by doing and not getting to the things that you should do. You know, you're kind of leaving the hard doing out and you're sometimes doing the doing that's just kind of numbing doing. Fours, fives, and nines are doing repressed in Enneagram language. And so there's an invitation for fours, fives, and nines to bring up productive doing. To do the thing that you need to do. For fours, that sometimes look, looks like, you know, going to Walmart and getting paper towels because you need it. It's not sexy. It's not fun. You know, I tell fours, uh, you know, now everybody's on keto, right? But a couple of years ago, everybody was doing Whole30. And I don't have the willpower, but God bless you ones who did it successfully. But, but I would say a couple of years ago, for fours, your whole 30 is avoid whole foods for 30 days, you know? Do your shopping at Kroger. Just join the human race, you know? Because fours, fours like to do things that are special and artistic and feel good. And there's an invitation to just bring up normal, productive doing, you know, pay your taxes. And, you know, go on and send that email you've been putting off sending. Threes, sevens, and eights, you, you know what's missing. What have I not talked about? You leave out feeling. And that doesn't seem fair, right? You're feeling. But, but feeling is, is not always, for three, sevens, and eights, sometimes you mistake feeling for passion. And you're passionate people, three, sevens, and eights. And so you feel passion. But you have lost touch with some of the tenderer, softer feelings, and you've lost touch with attending to the feelings of everybody around you. And so there's just an invitation for you, three, sevens, and eights, in the context of relationships especially, to do some extra work to pay attention to feeling. What are, what are you feeling and what are the people that you love feeling around you? And how can you attend to that in a deeper, more honest, more invested way? That's the first place where we can just start to use Enneagram wisdom to bring our lives into better balance is ones and twos and sixes. Stop yourself a couple times a day and ask, what am I thinking? You know, it, could I, should, should I do a little bit better thinking? What am I thinking about? Is it just about what's wrong? Is it just about relationships? Is it just about worst case scenario stuff? Fours and fives and nines, ask yourself, are you doing, are you doing the things that are yours to do? Are you getting to the right things? Are you getting to your one wild and precious life? Nines especially. Are you getting to your things to do? Fives, you know, 
You've thought about it. You've researched it. You've written about it. You've talked about it. You've gotten information about it. Now it's time to do it. And threes and sevens and eights, ask yourself a couple times a day, what am I feeling? And what are the people around me feeling? And are they, does it seem like I am acting in a way that they're kind of like not responding that well to? Are they feeling that I'm going too quickly? Are they feeling that I've left them behind? Just paying attention to feeling a little bit more. And particularly to the softer, tenderer, and, and lower side of feelings, sadness, loneliness, all that stuff, because threes and sevens and eights, they, they're happy to stay in kind of, it's good, and I'm fine, and we're happy, and we're good. But have you left out some of the, some of the lower side and reframed some of that? The second way to bring your life into deeper balance is through identifying what your Enneagram numbers orientation to time is. Okay, and so let me explain that. And this is our last little, you know, hope I'm not just, those of you who are brand new, thank you for being, I'll tell you how, what some extra resources are if you feel like, what in the world are we talking about? But um, orientation to time, past, present, future, right? Based on our Enneagram type, we lead the dance with one of those more than the others. And that's not good or bad, it just is. But what it means is we're all tempted to leave the other two out. And we need to bring our lives into balance by knowing what are you tempted to leave out and what do I need to do to go get those other two more. So ones and twos and sixes who I just talked about as being thinking repressed, you are oriented to the present. Now there's this whole discipline that's that, you know, lots of people talk about now about being present, right? Like almost in a, a mindfulness, Zen Buddhist kind of way of, of being present in the moment. And that's awesome. Ones and twos and sixes, you're not all that good at that kind of being present. <laughs> what you're good at is you're good at responding to the present moment. You're good at taking your actions and directing them toward what's happening right in front of you, what needs to be done, what needs to be fixed, who needs to be saved, who needs to be rescued, what plans you ought to make, what bad things could happen, what did you do wrong right now. Ones and twos and sixes, you are so focused on responding to the present moment that you will let the fires of the present moment get so big that they will take you off course from getting to your goals in the future. If you're a one or a two or a six, you know there are so many things that you meant to get to that you haven't gotten to because it's so busy right now. How could you get to them? And ones and twos and sixes, if you know that about yourself, you know you've got to do some extra work to avoid just getting trapped and drawn into all the present junkola. You've got to do some extra work to make sure you're setting goals, heading toward goals, and executing goals. And you've also got to do a little bit of extra work in integrating your past story into your present life. Fours and fives and nines, your orientation to time is the past, which means that fours and fives and nines remember and ruminate and expect things to happen like they've always happened and expect that today is going to be informed by what happened years ago. And they bring into relationships the kind of idea of, you know, what happened between us years ago. You're just, you, you remember the past. You rehearse stories from the past. You think about the past. That's great. That's wonderful. That's not a bad thing. That's a beautiful, intuitive way of being. Problem is, you can get stuck there. And if you're a four and a five and a nine, and you know you can get stuck there, now you can do a little bit of extra stuff to just make sure every once in a while you're attending to what's right in front of you. And to also make sure, like ones and twos and sixes, that you're setting goals and accomplishing goals and executing goals. And threes and sevens and eights, you're oriented to the future. You know, you've already 
whatever's on your calendar for tomorrow, you've already lived it in your mind. It's like it's already happened. You're kind of over it. You're ready for next week. You're already at next Wednesday. You're a week ahead. Threes and sevens and eights are just oriented to the future. It's wonderful. It's a gift. They bring, they help us all be visionary and look toward the future and not get stuck in the present. The problem is for threes and sevens and eights, sometimes that gets you in trouble because you're way out here and everybody else is still back here. Like, where'd you go? What happened? And I thought we were together. And so threes and sevens and eights, it's great. You've got all the visionary stuff. That's so good. You can teach us all a lot about how to set goals and make plans. But you also have to integrate what's happening in the moment. Sometimes, you know, each of our medicine is different. I can't give you my medicine. You can't give me mine. As a, as a two, as a one, two, six, I need to actually stop sometimes from responding to the present moment so that I can actually have a little space to make a future plan. Threes and sevens and eights have to do the opposite. You need to sometimes, every once in a while, let that future plan fall away so that you can be really good to the people that are right in front of you right now and make sure that you are present in relationship right now and you're not a mile ahead of everybody else that you live with. So threes and sevens and eights is the future that you're oriented to. So I share all that tonight to say the way that we can use Enneagram wisdom is, you know, we know our number, we can, we can learn our number, and that's a great place. If that's all we do with it, that's awesome. It's helpful, it's so good. That way we can have more compassion for ourselves and more compassion for other people. But if you've got the stomach to go a little bit further, once you know your number, you know which of thinking, feeling, and doing gets kind of left out. And you can ask yourself, how's that getting me into trouble? How's that getting me stuck? How is that, how's that getting me out of balance in some way? And you know what you're oriented to in terms of past, present, and future. And you can make sure that you spend a little bit of energy thinking about the other two that don't get as much attention. That's one way that we can just integrate the Enneagram into our lives be a little healthier, be a little bit better to ourselves. If we live a little bit more balanced, we will be better in relationships with other people and we'll be better in relationship with God. Not that you can be better in relationship with God, but we'll, we'll find our pathways toward union and community and unitive experience with God in deeper, more robust ways if we learn how to bring our own lives into balance.